Hello. Today we will be drawing a parallel between the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil and Sabbath. Now, the parallel would be trying to explain what God is trying to teach or was trying to teach Adam and Eve with the tree of knowledge good, of good and evil and what God is trying to teach us about Sabbath in the end times. So this is what we're going to try and do today. The first thing we might want to consider right at the beginning was, did Adam and Eve actually see God create anything? Well, if you thought about it, no, they didn't. Obviously, Adam and Eve was created when everything else was ready. Everything else was perfect for a living condition, and Adam came on and Eve came on, or created rather. So they didn't see any creation at all. And if they didn't, how could they know for sure that God was really the creator? It's a question you want to ponder. Adam and Eve had no absolute uh, empirical proof that God was their creator. And when God told them that he was their creator, they had Adam and Eve, Adam had to accept his declaration, God's declaration, by faith, because there was no other eyewitnesses. And there are no other basis for Adam and Eve not to have faith. And also God gave a number of commands to Adam in the Garden of Eden. He gave a positive command and he also gave a negative command. And the positive command would be that you are f free to eat of every tree in the garden. Uh, and this is seen in Genesis um, chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. And the negative command was that's one tree that you're not allowed to eat from, which is a tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam was not allowed to eat from that tree. Genesis 2, same, verse 16 to 17. So God had a positive command. Every tree you can eat and a negative command except this particular tree. Now note, out of all the trees in the garden, God reserved one for himself from which man was to totally abstain. And God chose this particular tree that Adam and Eve were not to touch. He chose it because he chose it as a test for Adam and Eve's faith that God is their creator. Now, location of the tree, you can see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. This tree was located right in the very middle of the Garden of Eden. It couldn't be more prominent, and you couldn't miss it at all. Now, also, God did not give Adam and Eve the option of choosing the tree from which they could not eat, meaning God particularly chose that specific tree. God chose it, not Adam and Eve. He chose, God chose that particular tree where Adam and Eve are not supposed to eat from it. And it pointed, and he pointed it out to Adam and Eve, expecting them to abstain from eating its fruit. So God made that choice from the very beginning. The reason is simply God wanted obedience or wanted to give Adam and Eve an experience of what being obedient was all about. Do we have any evidence that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was any different from the other trees of the garden? Well, no, not at all. It's not written in the Bible. There was no evidence that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was any different from any of the other trees in the garden. Perhaps they all look exactly the same. We were not told that it was taller or brighter or, or you know greener or, or whatever. It's not any. Neither did we. We were told to have any different kind of fruit than the other trees. The tree of the knowledge and good and evil was exactly the same type of tree that you could find in the Garden of Eden. Now, what made that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what made it different was not its external appearance. But what, it, what made it different was the fact that God had set that tree aside or God has set it apart from all the other trees that were in the garden. 
So in short, the tree was identified by God, by location and not by appearance. This particular tree, this tree of the knowledge and good of good and evil, belongs to God and is chosen by God for exclusive use of God. Now, if you, if you think about it, all the trees in the garden were God's property because he created them, every tree. But the tree of knowledge, of good knowledge, knowledge of good and evil was a spe special category. It belonged to God exclusively in a very special sense. Even though all the other trees of the Garden of, of, garden of Eden belonged to God, man was permitted to use them for his own pleasure. Every other tree, it's up to use, up to you, man, or up to you, Adam, to use it. But this particular particular tree of which is the tree of god of of knowledge of good and evil was not for man's use this particular tree was off limits and if you partake in it god's commandment was very clear you shall surely die you see god knew adam and eve had no empirical evidence or any form of proof that he was the creator. Adam had to believe God based on faith and thus obey God based on this faith. And God also knew that true obedience must come from choice. Now, without choice, you can call it coercion. So God had to introduce the concept of choice to Adam. Now, choice or free will cuts both ways. Unfortunately, Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. And God had to implement his redemptive plan to save humanity from extinction. You see, the forbidden tree was not there to catch Adam out, out or, or, or just to tempt him to, to make a mistake, not at all. The forbidden tree was introduced, was meant to give Adam the experience of what free will is. To give Adam the free will, his opportunity to, to demonstrate his faith and trust in God by obeying. Otherwise, Adam and Eve would simply be robotons, you know, they're just created to obey. So God didn't want that. To able to have a true choice, a true obedience can only come from free will. And in short, basically, it's a test that Adam and Eve's faith and Adam and Eve's obedience in the Lord to see if they were willing to recognize him as the creator and as the only true God. Now let's look a little bit about Satan's method of temptation. When you read the, the paragraphs, it's clear to say that Satan was not telling Eve that she and Adam would be little gods. Satan was actually telling her that they would be God, the God Almighty. And Satan unabashedly attacked God's sovereignty as the creator. And he knew, Satan knew that the only way he could get Adam and Eve to dishonor their creator, the Almighty God, was by getting them to use the very tree that God had reserved only for himself. In, in essence, getting Adam and Eve to disobey, to make the wrong choice. The adversary used the classic half-truth and lies to deceive Eve. See, half-truths or counterfeit tactics, this is the best lie. The best lie is the one that's closest to the truth. So if you take this experience and this thought about Adam and Eve and bring it forward to today, today we do not have any greater empirical or rational or historical or scientific proof beyond a reason, a proof that God was the creator than did Adam and Eve. After all, there are many plausible explanations 
for the origin of the world, the Big Bang, the intelligent design, the progressive creation, etc. The fact is that we can only be certain that God was the creator because the word of God says so. The fact is that we can only be certain because we accept this word of God by faith, not because we have any proven empirical or rational evidence. Yes, we do have evidence, but we do not have a hundred percent proof that God exists, that God is a creator. And in today's term, very similar to the command given to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what was the in, in the Garden of Eden? We remember we had a positive command and we had a negative command. And the positive command was you can eat from all the trees and a negative you can't eat from this particular tree. Now in today's term, what positive command did give God give in the fourth commandment? Well, God's, like God specifying all the trees in the garden for man's consumption, he also was specified that the first six days, you can do whatever you like in those first six days for, for humans. And that's a positive commandment. And the negative command was God also then, like he reserved one tree exclusively for himself, God today also said the fourth in the fourth commandment underlines the fact that he has reserved one day in the week, which is the seventh day of the week for himself. Now, this is a week that human beings are not allowed to do anything they like with it. This is a day that is specified and laid aside by God for a specific reason. So what we're saying is God specifically chose the tree from which Adam and Eve were not to eat. And in the same manner, the seventh day was specifically chosen by God at creation as his day of of rest. Now God has not given man the option of choosing on which day he will man will abstain from work. The fourth commandment does not say, well, remember to keep one day in the seventh, you know, just remember to keep every seventh day or remember to rest. No, God was very specific about the day which he chose. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. If you, if you look at this, is there any astronomical reason for a seventh day of the week that God created? Well, created? well actually, there is an ex, uh, astronomical explanation, explanation for the year. The well, year being, it is the amount of time it takes our planet to make one complete turn around the sun. So one year. There is also astronomical explanation for the month, which is it is the time period between one new moon and another. There is an explanation for why we chose the month. There is also an explanation for the day, for instance. That the day is the amount of time it takes one planet to make our, our planet, rather, um, the Earth, to make one complete revolution on its axis. So those are explainable, but you see, there is no astronomical explanation for a seven-day week. The only reason for the existence of the seven-day week is that God made it so at the beginning. Since time immemorial, the week has been composed of seven day because God said so. Now, just like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in external appearance had no physical difference between them and between the other trees and this particular tree. Just like that, Sabbath in its external appearance, Sabbath day, had really not much difference at all. In the same manner as that tree, every day of the week belongs to God because he made them. But the Sabbath belongs to God in a special sense. On the surface, the Sabbath looks just like any other day. It has 24 hours and the sun rises and the sun sets. It's just like any other day. We wake up, we go to sleep and, you know, we go to bed and we work. Same old, same old. 
But the Sabbath externally, exter the Sabbath externally looks the same. But what sets the Sabbath apart is not its external appearance, but the fact that God has reserved it for Himself. That God had made this particular day holy. Why did God make this particular day holy? Well, the Sabbath is a memorial, a reminder, a memorial of the Creator, of our God. It's a, it's a memorial of Him. And by observing the Sabbath as commanded by, the God, by God, we are recognizing the fact that He alone is God and we are His creators. As simple as that. It's, it's, it's a, an agreement to give sovereignty to God, the Creator. We are reminded that the tree of good and no knowledge, tree of knowledge or tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden was also meant to test men's willingness to accept God's sovereignty as the only Creator. Just like that, Sabbath is exactly the same. It is there to demonstrate that we are given allegiance and recognizing who the Creator is. By observing the command of keeping Sabbath holy is a sign that we are loyal to the true God. Now, imagine if you were the adversary, if you were Satan, he would dislike this day because this day is just telling the whole universe that we give sovereignty, we recognize sovereignty, and we give allegiance to a particular person, our God Almighty. And Satan's never going to like this. There can be no doubt that he hates the Sabbath because it reveals the absolute distinction between the Creator and the creature. At, at the beginning, at the beginning, Lucifer, or later called Satan, he wanted to be God. He wanted to usurp God's sovereignty, which is a preposterous idea if he is a mere creature. Satan's hatred for Sabbath stems from the fact that Sabbath itself identifies who the Creator is. That is the position that Satan wants to usurp. He wants to be the creator. It's almost ridiculous. How could a creation be a creator? Satan's hatred for the Sabbath can be discerned in a way he led Israel to persistently violate the Sabbath in the Old Testament by the way in which the religious leaders of Christ's days distorted its meaning and by the way Christians disdain and attack it today. You know, sometimes if you look at the perspective of some modern day Christians who may not know about the Sabbath or choose not to accept the truth about Sabbath when they are told, it's a result, a direct result of misinformation created by Satan. See, Satan has a counterfeit for each one of God's truth, and Sabbath is no difference. He has a counterfeit for Sabbath. It is important to remember that the counterfeit always comes after the genuine one in time, and that the counterfeit deceives because it is so similar to the genuine one. I mean, if you look at any of the commercial world where uh, some companies tries to counterfeit a market leader, they wouldn't create their own style and their own brand. They would even try and call it a similar name to the original brand, make it look similar to it, make it almost uh, operate similarly, because the best form of deceit is to make sure that it's as good-looking, as close to the genuine ones as possible. So God's genuine day of worship at the very beginning, right from creation, was the seventh day Sabbath. Now, should we expect a counterfeit day of this important day later in history? Well, you would expect that. Would it be a day which purports to honor God? I mean, this, this counterfeit day would purport to honor God. And you would say yes to both those questions. 
But in order to be deceptive, it would have to be a day which purports, purports to honor God. In other words, Satan's plan is not as blatant as he used to be. Now he's going to create a counterfeit day that people think that they're actually honoring God on this particular day. And this particular day that Satan created is really not Sabbath. It is another day except Sabbath. So what we get is people who genuinely think that they are worshiping God, but didn't even know that they're worshiping God in a, in a wrong day. In other words, these people do not know that they do not know. That would be the best form of counterfeit that Satan could ever create. You see, 99% of people in this world has been has embraced this concept. This Christian will have embraced this concept, thinking that they have they are honoring God on this particular day. And ninety nine percent of the Christians in this world are honoring and worshiping God on a Sunday, instead of the particular day that God has asked us and commanded us to keep holy, which was Saturday, which is a seventh day week. Seventh day of the week is Sabbath, which is Saturday. But you see, Satan has created a counterfeit day to worship God. And that counterfeit day is the day called Sunday, which comes from a traditional culture of sun God worship on this day. You see what has Satan does, done? See, the Sabbath is not per se better than any other day. The central issue in Sabbath observance is to worship God on the seventh day, which is Sabbath. It's not whether one day is better than another. Another. The central issue is whose authority do we accept? Meaning, if we kept the Sabbath, which means we worship the Lord on the Sabbath, we are then saying, I am recognizing the authority of the one who establishes and created us in the beginning. If we don't worship on Sabbath and we worship on any of the other days in the week, by keeping that day, meaning Sunday, for instance, we are then recognizing the authority of the power which made a day of worship that gives allegiance to Satan, not to the God. Inadvertently, I would say, by many Christians who are not aware that when you worship once a week and you worship it on Sunday and not Saturday, you are then saying inadvertently, I give my allegiance to the creator of counterfeit, the greatest father of lie, Satan. Well, I know this is a very controversial point to make, but it has to be made. You know, there's some arguments for Sunday worship or against Sabbath worship. Some people in today's world argue that because we do not execute people for those who break the Sabbath today, you know, you've decided not to worship on Saturday, you decide to worship on Sunday, you will not be executed. And th that is the argument that's been used. And, and Sabbath, therefore, is no longer binding upon Christians because, you know, you're not going to die. But this logic ignores the fact that people in the Old Testament were also executed for adultery. Remember that. And is adultery all right today because we do not execute people for it? Well, the fact is that knowingly trampling on Sabbath or God's law does not lead to immediate death today, but it will lead to the second death at the end of time. Meaning what we're saying is what is the penalty of violating the Sabbath? Eternal death. So in summary, I would like to quote um, a devotional book called Our High Calling. And this is written by E.G. White. 
on, and it, I'm quoting it from page 343, I quote, As the tree of knowledge was placed in the midst of the Garden of Eden, so the Sabbath command is placed in the midst of the Decalogue. In regard to the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the restriction was made, ye shall not eat of it, of it lest ye die, unquote. Genesis 3.3. 3. Of the Sabbath God said, ye shall not defile it, but keep it holy, and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, unquote. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. As the tree of knowledge was the test of Adam's obedience, so the fourth commandment, or the Sabbath commandment, is the test for us all today that God has given to prove the loyalty of all his people. It is a test of our loyalty. Fail this test, you will be sending a message to say, I am not loyal to the Lord. And if you're not loyal to the Lord, then you by default you're loyal to the other side. So in conclusion, Sabbath is absolutely important, just as the tree of knowledge of good and evil is just as it was important to Adam. So remember this, study this, meditate on this, and not to be fooled by the counterfeits that have been given by our adversary. Say true to the Lord, trust the Lord, obey the Lord by faith, and we'll be saved. God bless.